Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is uh, November 16th, 2019. It's Thrive Eve. Uh, we are here this weekend for our first annual uh, Thrive Day celebration, which is tomorrow, November 17th, uh, here in Salt Lake City. We now have uh, 1,600 people registered for our first Thrive Day event. We've never done this before, but we, we created an all-day event um, focused on healing and growth for people who uh, are no longer either Orthodox Mormons or who have left the Mormon Church. But what's different about it, what's exciting about it is Thrive Day is 100% dedicated to healing and growth and community. Um, and it's kind of answering the question of what next after Mormon Orthodoxy or after Mormonism. So we have an amazing array of speakers uh, planned for tomorrow, as, as many of you know. Uh, it's, it's keynoted by uh, Wayne Sermon, the lead guitarist of Imagine Dragons. We have a bunch of phenomenal speakers like Natasha Alfred Parker and Lacey Green and Hans Matson and uh, a list uh, too long uh, to recite by memory. But, but trust me, an amazing list of speakers. And <clears throat> we're really super excited uh, to have been able to bring from uh, New York uh, what I'm calling our, our Gentile guest or our Gentile speaker, and she's gracious enough to laugh about that. Uh, we are bringing, we have brought Amber Scora, the author of an amazing book, an important book for uh, not just uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, but for Mormons and for the world. Uh, the book is Leaving the Witness, um, Exiting a Religion and Finding a Life by Amber Scora. And we've had Amber on Mormon Stories podcast previously. It's a great interview. We're not going to be redoing that interview tonight. We want to refer you back to it. So just type in. I'm sure it's the only Amber Scora Mormon result on YouTube in or on, on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or wait, Google, not either of those. So check it out. It's a great interview. Um, but we're here uh, live streaming from the Community of Christ building in Holiday, Utah. And we're here in front of a live uh, congregational audience. So let's have a round of applause for our, our audience and for, but most importantly for you, Amber, we're so thrilled to have you here. Yeah, if you had ever told me in my life that I would be an ex Jehovah's Witness in a church talking to an ex-Mormon, I would never, <laughs> ever have believed you. Or an ex-Mormon crowd. Yes. And I'm sure that uh, there are probably people here who are other things, maybe active we'll Mormons, maybe liberal Mormons, maybe there are some Jehovah Witnesses or ex-Jehovah Witnesses, who knows? Everybody's welcome. Our intent is to just share stories and to share perspectives and to bring as much light and truth into the world as we can, and we're so glad you're with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So uh, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to try and do a couple things. We want to get as many questions from our uh, audience as we can. I'm going to be following uh, the live stream uh, on Facebook to the extent that I can, and I welcome any of our, our viewers on Facebook to uh, feel free to chime in with some questions as well. And as time permits, we'll incorporate those uh, as well. Um, but but most, you know, most importantly, welcome the Mormon Stories listening audience to another hour or so with Amber Scora. Um, most of you will be watching or listening to this after today. So thanks to the listeners and viewers who are joining us. So, so Amber, the book is uh, <clears throat> Leaving the Witness. And uh, we don't want to totally repeat the story, but um, what are what types of things do you like to kind of begin with when you do these when these book interviews? How do they normally start? Uh, a lot of people like to know what's it like growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. A little bit just of background, and so I think Jehovah's Witnesses are always in the public view, um, and especially more so now that they sit by cards and they do their witnessing work that way. Um, but a lot of people don't really know much about Jehovah's Witnesses or what they believe. And so I just usually give a bit of, bit of background. Let's um, do it. Yeah. So uh, you're, you're quite, as a Jehovah's Witness, you're raised, uh, as, as one that was raised Jehovah's Witness as me, um, you're taught that you're set to keep separate from the world. And so this manifests itself in many different ways. But most people know that we don't celebrate birthdays or celebrate Christmas. 
Um, so that's sort of one aspect of it. But also there's a lot of other ways that Jehovah's Witnesses are different. And uh, for example, we are constantly admonished not to go to college, not to establish any kind of career, um, and to basically use our lives uh, to just promote basically to preach and to promote the message of the organization, the Jehovah's Witness organization. So um, the reason for this is because uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are an apocalyptic group, and they believe that we're living in the last of the last days, and they've predicted different dates for the end of the world over the era, but over the eras, but basically now it's gone on so long that the world hasn't come that they are saying it's just basically any second now. It could happen tonight in this church. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great finale? Um, <laughs> but uh, so that informs a lot of the things that you do as a Jehovah's Witness and a lot of the decisions you make. And that's why you're, you don't get a career and you don't, you basically use your life to promote this kingdom interest. Um, that's sort of like. And it's fundamentally, it, it's kind of interesting because it is a, it, it's a religion that identifies as Christian. Yes. But, but it's viewed. Can... But it's viewed as a cult, and that's something Mormons can identify with. We, we very much as Mormons think of ourselves as Christian, but the broader Christian community thinks of us as evil and bad and dangerous and scary. Yeah. Talk about how you, how a Jehovah's Witness would view themselves as Christian, and then talk about why the mainstream Christian religions don't view you that way. If you don't well, mind. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses take a very literal <coughs> translation of the Bible, and they have their own translation of the Bible, and so they. Um, it seems to me almost that the doctrine was formed over the you know decades that they would pull out certain things that they saw in the scriptures and make that one of their doctrines. So, for example, we all probably know about the no blood transfusion rule. You know that was pulled out of somewhere in the Old Testament. And then there's uh, other things like in Revelation, for example, when it talks of the number 144,000 in a, most people would consider that to be a symbolic number. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses think of that as a literal number of people who are gonna to go to heaven. They also believe in, they're not so much, the emphasis is not on heaven and hell or anything like that, but they believe that there's going to be an end of the world, as I said, an apocalypse, and then after that, um, people will go on to live forever in paradise on earth. Jehovah's Witnesses, I should say, would go on to live forever. It looks like we have our first question, so. Uh... Great. All right, so I also served a mission in Taiwan. For, oh, I was, I was the Mormon missionary. Did you wear a missionary. helmet? I did. <laughs> I rode the bikes and had the helmet. What and, year? <laughs> uh, I was there from 2009 to 2011. Uh, I left by then. Okay. Yeah, I just was wondering if you could talk about your experience in Taiwan and, and learning the, the Chinese language and how that impacted your kind of worldview and your view on your American religion. Um, Taiwan is such a wonderful place, and I love the Taiwanese, Taiwanese <laughs> people so much. Um, Basically, for Jehovah's Witnesses, Taiwan is kind of a training ground for China because Taiwanese brothers and sisters cannot go to China safely, but a Westerner who learns Chinese can. Um, and so, uh, basically, the Taiwanese just, Jehovah's Witnesses are sort of like this hub where they come and teach you the language and teach you, you know, what you need to know in order to move on to preach in China. Um, so, for me, learning Mandarin... Uh, I was very driven, and a lot of people will ask me, how did you learn Mandarin that fast? Because I hadn't even, not even fast, it was slow, <laughs> let's be honest, but to the point where I could, you know, get quite fluent. And um, part of the reason was because no one has a drive to learn a language like someone with a drive to convert people. And so my, I remember one time I was sitting in my Mandarin class, uh, two hours a day in Taipei, and the teacher, you know, she was very direct, as teachers in Taiwan can be. And she was sitting in class one day, and there was, I think, four students in the class. And she just sort of was like talking and said, you know, you, pointing at me, you'll be fluent in Chinese in two years. And I was like, two years? And then she pointed at another student and was like, you, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, my drive to convert people really paid off in my dedication. And also it helped because... A lot of foreigners that go to Taiwan to learn Chinese are not um, interacting as much with the locals, and all of the you know people in our congregation were Taiwanese, and um, you know I was out preaching using my Chinese all the time, and I, I think back to those poor Bible students that I had. I used to use our literature in Chinese and sit there and try to explain what I was saying in Chinese, and I mean the looks on their 
faces because, you know, you could learn, I learned, you know, for three years before I got to the point where I think I could say a coherent sentence that people could understand because learning the language is not just learning, you know, vocabulary and grammar. It's, I'm sure you found the same. It's like learning an entirely different way of thinking, which looking back now, I credit with waking, giving me the space, the mental space to sort of see myself with a different perspective or see my beliefs with a different perspective. A couple other, oh, oh, real quickly. So Mormon missionaries spend two, if they go on a foreign speaking mission, spend two months in what's called the Missionary Training Center doing like eight hours of intensive language instruction a day for, for two months. I don't, I don't know that I asked you this on the podcast. What is your preparation like? How do Jehovah's Witnesses, like what, how do you, okay, this is, I re, I'm really curious now. So like, how do you receive the call? How do you find out where you're going? It, for us, we get this letter that everyone gathers around to see where you're called. So how do you get, the, is it through a letter? Is there some other means? How do you get the call? And then when, how are you trained and prepared to learn the language to go? Oh, this is a really good question because for Jehovah's Witnesses, there's not, there's a certain small subset of um, witnesses who are trained to go to a special school they called Gilead. And very few people go and only married couples go. Um, you have to sort of be like have very good spiritual qualifications. But they encourage, I didn't qualify, but they encourage the um, rank and file, the masses, to learn another language, especially more so in recent years, and to self-fund a mission somewhere overseas. And so for a person like me who had been what we called a pioneer, preaching 70 hours a month for quite a number of years in my home territory in Vancouver, British Columbia, just knocking on doors to not, like so much boredom, it was really an attractive idea to me to go and go to this other place and learn a language. So we always would uh, support ourselves. The church didn't support us. We worked part-time jobs. And you could pick, you could be interested in going somewhere, but you would have to write a letter to the branch, the headquarters, and ask, you know, can I go to this country? And they would, you know, look at your records and talk to the elders in your congregation and see whether they thought that you were spiritual enough to handle it. Clearly, I wasn't. <laughs> Assessing your spirituality. But, um, yeah, but to go to China, not many people are go because of the nature of the work there being illegal. And so they're very careful about how, who they let go and how many people they sanction to go. Yeah. And as I, as I remember in the book, and this is something I think that is very familiar with Mormon missionaries in places like China and, and Russia, you're not always there on totally up and up honest pretenses do, no. you, do you do kind of you do kind of goofy visa things where you oh yeah talk about that yeah well sort of the the watchtower organization ran into a bit of a problem because they discourage everyone from getting a university education but then they want to have people go overseas and preach and a lot of the ways that people can do this is if they get a job as an english teacher or some other profession but generally any of those jobs require a university degree and so we ran into that problem but of course the holy spirit always finds a way and um we ended up you know sort of through the back channels finding out that there's these degrees that you could get online at the time and one university which I don't think even exists but they would credit all of your hours preaching of which I had many um, towards saying it was work experience or something like research and then you, all you had to do to get a degree was pay three thousand dollars write a uh, hundred multiple choice test question and some sort of essay so I, I was married at the time, like most Jehovah's Witnesses, I get, you get married young. And uh, so my husband and I couldn't afford to each get a degree. And so we decided, I guess he was the man, he was going to be the educated one. So he, uh, he did the 100 multiple choice questions and I wrote the essay for him and then he got the degree. Yeah. So then, yeah, we, you know, China, okay. A lot of things are a little done sketchily, you know, with greasing the palms. And so uh, even though as Jehovah's Witnesses, we were taught to be honest and, you know, people of good character, when it came to something like this, of course, the idea was because it's God's will that we go and preach, you basically just do whatever you have to do, lie, cheat, steal, <laughs> as long as you can stay, then that's what matters. 
in, in the post-Mormon community, I think we have a name for that. Do you guys know what that is? Lying for the Lord. That's what we oh, call yeah. it. Do, is there anything comparable in... Are there any, any no. ex-Jehovah's Witnesses in the house? <laughs> Let me think. They call it, like, there's this one term they call it theocratic warfare, right. which they used to justify a the lot of things, yeah, where it was sort of like, you know, we do, we're law-abiding, but if ever the laws of Caesar conflict with God's laws, then you have license to lie or make yeah. excuse for things that you wouldn't normally do. Um, another really interesting way that we're, we're cousins or maybe used to be cousins, and this is really interesting because if you go back and listen to the Lloyd Evans interview, it, you know, he talks in depth about the num numerous times the Jehovah's Witness tradition, you know, a leader predicted a specific date when Jesus would come again. And um, it happened several times, including right around World War I, yeah. The beginning of World War I. Um, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about just some of those instances? And then I'll, I'll follow up with what, what, what... I know you talked about it a bit, but... Yeah, I, I'm by no means a Jehovah's Witness historian, uh, but I do know that the original founder, Charles Taze Russell, had some ideas in mind, which I think he adopted from Miller, uh, maybe Seventh-day Adventist-type branch of religion at the time. Um, and then when those dates failed, slowly, you know, they got pushed out or different explanations were made. For example, I think either the leader or one of his successors had predicted that 1914, they, they used all these like Daniel prophecies and weird random things in Revelation to come to the conclusion that 1914 was going to be a very significant date, the end of the world, I, I believe they said at the time. And then when World War I broke out, they were like, well, of course, we just made a mistake. And actually what it meant was the end of the last or the beginning of the last days. So it's the beginning at, of the end of the yeah. world, right? And then from that point on, there was, you know, 1930s something. And then... The last one, which was a bad one, was 1975, uh, when the Watchtower heavily alluded that that date was significant and likely the end of the world, though didn't come out and say it. But it was strong enough that Joe's Witnesses started selling their houses and they were sort of encouraging people to just use all their money to preach, um, live it up until Armageddon. <laughs> um, and then 1975 came and went, and I think a lot of people were left because of that disappointment. So after that, the organization kind of learned their lesson and they just keep this continuous urgency, which from the time I was a child never relented and periodically they would find ways to sort of up the pressure. And you know, it's a funny thing because when I think back, you know, in the eighties when I was a kid, it was, you know, it was the cold war. There was, there's always something scary that you can pick up on in the world and start pointing to it as being like, Oh, this is the apocalypse coming. You know, they had all these prophecies about the king of the north and the king of the south, and it's Russia, and it's all these things they had pulled out from the Bible as significant. Uh, and then when that phase passed, you know, now it's whatever. It's Trump. It's climate change. Like, all of these things mean that the Jehovah's Witnesses are right and the world is about to end. There's always something scary in the world that you can pick out and turn it into a reason to be fearful, and that's why these apocalyptic religions keep on resurfacing and never really go away because it's the answer to that fearing of uncertainty that we have as human beings. And there's so many crazy things about that. Like one is that if you're a student of history at all, you'll know that Christians have been waiting for Christ to come again for 2,000 years. That literally people that were alive after he died were waiting for him to come back right after he had died. And and, and so it's like, when's he going to come? Like Christians at some point have to just say, when's he coming? That's interesting. But it's also interesting that, and I've studied a tiny bit about kind of religious psychology, you, you would sometimes always expect a religion to just completely fold if a leader predicts something like, you know, Christ coming on a certain date and then Christ doesn't come on that date. Sometimes that actually makes people believe stronger in the religion when when the prophecy doesn't come true yeah is that is that right yeah i think that is a thing that happens and it's um i think it just makes you double down because you have even more at risk that you can't be wrong when you believed that it was coming and then you get disappointed it's like anything i found looking back whenever there was something that didn't add up or that didn't that sort of felt off to me i would just thought block basically i just wouldn't entertain those doubts or those thoughts so I think it's the same with these failed dates that 
if you sat and logically thought about it, you would feel like this is not the true religion. But there was a way that there's narratives formed around these things, even within the religion, where you know, the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses will always say, we're not prophets, we're just being, you know, we're used to direct, we're God's um, organization on earth. So they, they can somehow give all these edicts that are beyond the Bible about the way that we must live or how, what, what's going to, you know, some doctrine. Um, but then when it's the other way, when we say like, okay, but why did you set a date and then it didn't come true? They say, well, you know, the light is getting brighter, we're not prophets, that's not what we're here for. So it's kind of slippery. Yeah, and, and for those of you who are students of Mormon history, you'll, you'll remember something like Zion's camp where Joseph gets his prophecy that he's going to lead all these soldiers down to, was it Missouri, and, and sort of like take on the Missouri government or the militia. And so they all march down with him, and he prophesies a victory. But then they get kind of, they get not slaughtered, but they just sort of like get their rear ends handed to them. And what he ended up doing was telling the soldiers that it was because of their lack of faith. And so sometimes what religious leaders do, if their own prophecies don't come to pass, is they blame the members for their lack of valiance. And that can then increase their allegiance because it's like, oh my gosh, it's my fault that Jesus didn't come. Mm -hmm. So now I've got to be more righteous. It's a weird yeah, the, psychological thing. Yeah, the, the Joseph's organization did that in a slightly different way, just that even though they had strongly alluded that this end was coming, they would turn back and say, well, we didn't really say that. It was you, the rank and file, who were jumping to conclusions. And I think sometimes they also change their old literature. Like you can get back copies of things or these volumes of past issues of the Watchtower and Awake. Uh, and there's things that they sort of alter and scrub. They, they change and scrub and erase things that were said? Yeah, I've, I've heard people say that if you could, there's even a what? book, that, like things go out of print, you can't get it anymore. Things go out of print? <laughs> yeah. Is Interesting. That... <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, a bell? I'm... <laughs> no, no, no. We, we have very similar things. And yeah. it's probably a very human tendency. It's, it's probably not just our two uh, faith traditions or former faith traditions. Um, but also just something that is so mind-boggling. Do you know the name of our formal church? Do you? Uh, yeah, Jesus Christ. Church? Yeah, say it. Say it. <laughs> it's so long. <laughs> I know. It's so long. <laughs> we love that, right? Did church, you hear that they... Wait, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? <laughs> she got it. Now take, take a deep breath to no recover one. from having to say it. Did you hear that our prophet made it like illegal for us to say the word Mormon anymore or to call ourselves no. Mormons? Oh, wait, I did hear that. Yeah, yeah. But then didn't they say it was okay again? Uh, it's really confusing. It's hard to keep, up, not, with. It's hard to keep up a little bit. But, but here's the point I'm making. Of Latter-day Saints, there's a reason why we had that big, long name. Yeah. It's because when Joseph Smith formed Mormonism he was going to be ushering in the coming of the Messiah. And he was talking about Jesus coming during his lifetime, but then he died. And then, like, they kept talking about it. And then, eventually, it was supposed to be in 1890, right? And everybody's waiting for Jesus to come in 1890. I don't think he came. And, and I wonder if any of our dates overlapped. I don't know. <laughs> Even when two of these religions predict the date... God, where are you? <laughs> yeah, totally. But what was super weird is that like he was telling people, everyone's got to move to Independence, Missouri, because that's where Jesus is going to come, Independence, Missouri. And you got to come and everybody moved there. But then like when they got kicked out, it's like, well, what do you do? Right. And so they went to Illinois and then, but, the, but just the crazy thing is, is that it's in our name. And as a people, we've stopped really waiting in, in a sense and it's always in the back of our minds that it might come someday. Uh -huh. And it's used with every generation. How many of you were told that you were the last generation here to be ushered in? And you'll notice the age variances are anywhere from, from young people to uh, less young people. <laughs> less young people. But we're all told we're the chosen generation to usher in Jesus is coming. Yeah. But we've stopped really expecting it. But then it's used to motivate us. And so... In our, in our way, it's sort of been erased from our active culture, but still used in our passive culture to motivate. It's and so is it more a fear of not having an afterlife that keeps people in it? Because I know for Jehovah's Witnesses, a big thing is surviving Armageddon. Even at one point in my life, I was, when I was younger, I left for a little while um, because I committed immorality uh, with my boyfriend. And the whole time I was out, 
I was terrified Armageddon would come, and that's what brought me back. So if you, is it the afterlife that keeps you? I'd be, I'd be curious if... The culture? You know, there is a lot of guilt, fear, and shame in Mormonism, but I don't know if in my experience it was around worrying about that I would be burned if when Jesus came. And I'm curious, you had, you had that, so one of our... No. You didn't? Come on up, you got to come up and talk into the mic if you want to. <laughs> yeah, we, we have other, we have, you know, our, our thing is masturbation and sexual impurity, and that's the way <laughs> we, we get guilt and shame. I see. And about the afterlife. Well, witnesses but, have that too, yeah. I, I mean, I think you don't want to talk about the millennium if it's never going to come. So I think at some point we stopped emphasizing maybe, that. Maybe finally Joe's witnesses will... Maybe. Too. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how people can still believe it's coming after all it's this It's been time. a long time, Jesus. Like, <laughs> if you're going to come. Yeah. So what was hounded into my brain as a child and what I've talked to with my friends who have left and even uh, my family members who are still in, it's the threat of not being with your family after um, you die. Yeah. So there is that guilt and shame aspect, but it's less about, it's about what happens after. It's like fear of missing out. Yeah, but that on like, the afterlife, believe, or the the church believes. I don't. I'm an exmo. It's fine. So um, that when they die, that like my family will be, my parents will be in the celestial kingdom, the highest degree of heaven, without me. Yeah, and I'll be in hell, basically. Um, well, it's similar. So, yeah, it's similar with the witnesses in that, yeah. except that we all your all your family and friends will be in paradise, living in log cabins, making goat cheese. I don't know. Like it was. <laughs> Someone told me, like, that sounds like Brooklyn. I don't know, like making goat cheese, artisanal cheese or something. No, but, like, it was the idea that everyone was there without you. Yeah. And it's a real sticking point, no matter whether the location is heaven or earth or whatever it is, but yeah. the idea that this exclusion that you would feel. Or, well, and shunning as well. And, that's a huge and shunning thing is a huge thing, guys. like the community and the loss of your family is obviously a big motivator in the here and now. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause for... So let's talk, uh, let's see. So you, you endured some, and you, you've already alluded to this today, and we talked about this a bit in, in our previous interview, and it's so great in the book. A lot of your sexual shame came before you became a missionary um, and got married. Yeah. And one of the things that we share as faith traditions is this sort of notion of a disciplinary council, where in, in we have the dubious sort of, shared experience of both having sat in front of a disciplinary council for our respective faith traditions. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? I don't mean to be glib about something that, was it horrifying? Was it terrible? No, I mean, I, it, it's really fascinating in a way because um, I'm not sure how it is with Mormons, but for Jehovah's Witnesses, um, women don't hold positions in the church at all. And so if you ever commit a sin, you have to be deemed either as repentant enough that you can stay in the congregation or you need to be excommunicated, what we call disfellowshipping. But the people who make that decision are three elders from your congregation. So, you know, you know, some, but the sin could range anything from that you cheated a brother or that you stole something or that you voted, that you got a blood transfusion. But most of the time it's to do with sexual misconduct, as they call it. And um, when I was 19, I had a boyfriend from the time I was 16. Um, you know, when you get married at, most people were getting married at 18. It's not that unusual. But um, my boyfriend was kind of a bit of a free thinker of a Jehovah's Witness, actually. And I was a real goody two-shoes. But clearly there was something latent in me that kind of liked the rebel. Um, and we ended up having sex before we got ma- and we didn't, we weren't married. And so uh, I had to go and... Let me, let me ask really quick. How does a... Re- and you were a real believer, right? Oh, yeah. So this is probably a, a silly or an obvious question, but like, how do you have sex but know that it's super wrong? Like, as a teen... Have you ever been 19? <laughs> <laughs> and in love? Have I ever been 19, she said. No, no, no. I, I actually... I mean, there are Mormons that make it to marriage without sex. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of Joe's witnesses, too. I mean, I was kind of an anomaly in the end. Um, But I think a lot of people do. Maybe we just don't know about it. But so what you have to do, though, it's a funny thing. A lot of people that aren't 
from this kind of religious tradition and ask, well, why did you confess? They would never know. But if you think you're going to die at Armageddon, you're constantly told this at the meetings week in and week out, that if you hide any sin, that's like a sin against God and you will be killed at Armageddon. Well, then you confess. And so you confess sometimes in the hopes of, you know, being re, uh, sort of deemed repentant enough that you won't have to be kicked out. You'll just get some loss of privileges, like you won't be allowed to comment, or maybe they'll um, reprove you, which is it's kind of strange. They just go up to the platform and say your name and that you've been reproved and no one knows why. But of course, everyone's imagination runs wild. Or, uh, you know, if you don't be, if you're not deemed dependent enough, you will be disfellowship. So when I went, um, I, my conscience was bothering me, but I was sort of torn at heart because I was really in love with my boyfriend. And so I went to confess and it's three older men and it was very odd. I was 19. I'm you know, talking about pretty intimate stuff. And in order to deem whether you're a repentant or not, they have to ask you a lot of really personal questions. For example, you know, um, did he climax? Like, did you enjoy it? Was it premeditated? Why are um, you guys nodding your heads? <laughs> Or shaking your head. And, you know, as a woman, as a this young woman... This is another thing we share in our mutual uh -huh. tradition. <laughs> so, yeah, as a young woman, you can imagine that's pretty intimidating. And then I remember at one point there was one of the elders, for some reason, and they're quite a bit older than me. They weren't, like, ancient or anything, but, you know, they were married men. And they, one of them told me, you know, I still can see his face. Uh, he was like, you know we have to really like police, I can't remember the scriptures now about like policing your flesh. And he's like, you know, for me, for example, it's very hard for me to stay loyal to my wife. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I'm only 19. I don't really want to know like what your problems are with your marriage. But he started to get into it. So it was a strange thing. And so what happens is they hear you and they confer and decide, you know, you go leave the room and then they decide whether you're repentant enough. Um, but unfortunately for me, they did say, you know, we don't actually have to disfellowship you because they kind of, I think because I was a lot younger than my boyfriend, they sort of blamed him a little bit. But I t they were like, but you know, you have to stop. You cannot, you know, keep on with this conduct or you will be disfellowshipped. And so I told them, you better just disfellowship me. Because you didn't want to <laughs> I was stop. like, I can't stop. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like, I'm just, I'm a very honest person. So, um, and we had the time of our life, let me tell you. I mean, <laughs> I don't regret it. There's a song about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In, from the we'll 80s. we karaoke tomorrow night. I'll dedicate it to <laughs> That's him. That's your song. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so we had a good time. But the problem was, um, you know, it wasn't, we couldn't have a good time for very long because we started to feel, like, ridden with guilt and fear. For me, I was worried that Armageddon was going to come while I was disfellowshipped and then where would I be? And then something else happened when I was disfellowshipped is that my dad died quite suddenly. And, um, you know, they had his funeral in the Kingdom Hall. But as a disfellowship person, what that means as a Jehovah's Witness is that no one can talk to you. And in order to get back to be reinstated, you have to attend all the meetings and show your repentance by going there. But you sit in the back row. No one talks to you. You come when the meeting starts. You leave right when it ends. So, so you don't make others uncomfortable to have to yeah. overtly shun you. It's just get out before you Yeah, but even if I did, if they saw you on the street, they're supposed to turn the other way. Like there's no contact when you're shunned. Even your family is supposed to do that. Um, so when my dad uh, died and his funeral, I, it was the same thing because it was in the Kingdom Hall. I had to sit in the back. No one talked to me. Um, my dad's best friend like gave the this, this service um, and I just had to leave out the back door. So that was a, a really difficult thing to be so young, lose your father, and also have just no support even from family. And there was this added thing where, well, now that my dad had died, you know, he would be resurrected into the paradise. And if I didn't come back to be a witness, I would never see him again. So after that, the impetus to go back was really strong. And eventually we both got reinstated. But we had to split up because we couldn't stop. And do you <laughs> we think of that? <laughs> And you think of that as like, okay, that was a fun time, but I was ready to move on. Or is it, I said goodbye to the love of my life. And I think it's always hard to say because, you know, that first love has such an impact on you. And also because he was such a cool Jehovah's Witness, like it was really hard to find anyone else that, you know, played guitar and liked to move like movies with sex in them and like listen to music. I don't know. It was, you know, a lot of the Jehovah's Witness men were not as cool as that. 
funny postscript to the story is that years later, um, you know, I didn't see him for years and I was in China and then I left the religion and I always wondered whatever happened to him. And uh, one day I, you know, he was a bus driver in my hometown. And I think I still like kind of some part of me still loved him, even though I had married someone else. And one day I was downtown visiting home from China and I had just left the religion. And I would always still look in the buses and see, just couldn't help myself to see if I would see him. And I was standing downtown and a bus door opened and I looked inside and it was him. So I got on the bus and I was a new apostate. And I was like, surely he of all people left. Like he was such a rebel. He, he had a hard time conforming. Um, anyway, I got on the bus and I was like, hey, are you, did you leave? Are you still a witness? And he still was. He still believed in it. And I was like, you don't ha you, we have to talk. Like, I couldn't believe I was the one that got out first. Anyway, I spent the night basically trying to apostatize with him. And after that, I never saw him. I went back to China. I eventually moved to New York. And then years later, his sister, I found her, and she told me that he left too. So I always like to think that even though he was the first rebel, in the end, I was the true rebel. <laughs> <laughs> but he's out now too, so that's kind of a nice end to the story. Part of what's, and I'll just plug the book again, part of what's heartbreaking, part of the heartbreaking part of this Leaving the Witness book is when you do enter into that marriage, your your marriage, your first marriage, yeah. and and you guys end up as missionaries. But I, I got the sense that you kind of married out of guilt, you married out of obligation. You didn't marry sort of the love of your life, but it was more sort of like, okay, I had my prodigal years, I was a sinner, now I've got to make it right, now I've got to do the dutiful things. And a marriage sort of forged out of duty can be a really lonely, uh, sad experience do you want to yeah talk, is, is, am i and i don't want to project or like mischaracterize your experience so yeah no i think <clears throat> people underestimate the power especially at that age of your peer group and when i got reinstated i was already 21 by that point and everyone was married it's like everyone i knew was married and it was weird to not be married at that age and i was already like oh my goodness i'm kind of old. Um, How many of you guys were married by 21? Raise your hand if you were married by 21. Yeah. How about by 23? Raise your hand if you were married by 23 or younger. Yeah. So when, you know, there's lives that are put before you like as models and if you don't see how you, you when you're in a culture like that, you, as a human being, you, you sort of, you work within the parameters of what you are laid out for you, especially at that age. And so it was just the thing that was done. And, um, I mean, my, my, um, ex-husband, he's, he's a really good guy. He wasn't a bad husband. Like he wasn't, um, mean or terrible or anything, but we just weren't, it should have been at that age, someone that you dated for a year. And then we're like, Oh, you know, we're better as friends. We can all move on. But, you know, unfortunately it's not like that. You meet quickly, you, you know, get engaged quite quickly because no one wants to sin. And then, um, the, suddenly the wedding is there and you're married. And then, you know, a year later you're like, wait a minute, this is forever. And you have no other re way out because divorce is not permitted. So, you know, I mean, I think some people get lucky when they get married young and they are compatible, but I think the divorce rate is very high in Jehovah's Witnesses, at least for this reason. And that, you know, if I think of the person I was then, I didn't, I didn't really know what, who I was or what I really wanted. Yeah. Um, all right. So I do have more questions, but why don't we go ahead and invite people to come, whoever wants to start. Uh, if you have any questions for Amber, go ahead and start lining up here and we'll just, we'll bounce back and forth. We've got a couple ready and listeners. I will also, those of you in Facebook land, uh, I will I will intersperse, intermingle your questions with our viewing audience as time permits. So let's get, I'll just say hello, Steve. Hi, Amber. Thanks for coming. Two questions. The first one, perhaps the briefest, regarding what you just said, regarding shunning. Yeah. How, how would shunning show itself when two witnesses are in the public space? For example, a shopkeeper and a customer where one is shunned and the other is not? Yeah. How would that look different? Or, you know, teacher, student, principal, teacher, any of those public types of relationships? Yeah, and that does come up because a lot of witnesses work together, like someone will have a business and all their employees are 
Jehovah's Witnesses. So essentially in a case like that, I think that what is, it's encouraged that you just keep it to the bare minimum and you only interact on the level of what needs to be said to get the job done in whatever case that is. And I think a lot of people are encouraged to seek other employment in that case if they, if say, if their boss was disfellowshipped or vice versa. I mean, there's employment laws, so it's not like you can just fire someone for no reason, but um, people, it, it gets uncomfortable. And then the other thing to consider, though, is that a lot of people who are disfellowshipped want to come back, and so it might just be a temporary arrangement. Now, when it comes to family, the religion has become more and more extreme about what shunning means, and they've extended it to immediate family members. And, for example, I know there's many witnesses, ex-witnesses, who's grown, own, like, their own children who say, me as a mother, I raised my child in the religion. Then I, you know, got older and realized... It was a cult. I left. Well, their own child has been indoctrinated, and their own child won't speak to them. It's very common, and vice versa. It goes both ways. So even I know a lot of people that were, say, teenagers living at home with their parents, and they got disfellowshipped, and they were kicked out of the house. So it, you know, it, it's pretty extreme, and it, the suicide rate is very high. I mean, it's especially when you're young, it's a really harsh punishment, and you know, there's videos that they show at our annual conventions now where they act out these sort of highly produced sort of like little mini vignettes and in one of them there it's about a woman a young woman who gets disfellowshipped and in in one scene the mother picks up her phone and sees it's her daughter calling on FaceTime and she just puts down the phone and this is what they model you know at their internet like the conventions that are around the world as what the behavior should be so I don't know many Jehovah's Witnesses who have left, especially for reasons of apostasy, who aren't completely shunned by their family, not to mention all of your friends. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> a few months back, uh, the Witnesses combed through my neighborhood. It was a Saturday. And uh, when I got home, I found an invitation from them on my door, uh, an invitation to something that they called the memorial. Yeah. So to be a good neighbor, I attended it. Oh, wow. Uh, it was held at the, uh, the local city hall, government building, yeah. in the conference room. Uh, attendees were two, 300. Uh, I may well have been the only non-witness in the room. I'm not sure. I didn't dress for the part. Yeah. I was in jeans and uh, leave it at that. And um, I was there as a curiosity seeker and to yeah. be a good neighbor. They had something uh, that resembled the Lord's Last Supper. Yeah. Uh, unleavened bread and wine. Mm -hmm. um, rather than detail that, I'm going to ask you to. Yes. Uh, I didn't take it. I didn't see anybody else take it. I approached one of the ushers at the end who, say, who confided in me that two people in the room took it. Oh. A couple of uh, very senior people. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it for you to tell the rest of I know what what's occurring about. What's occurring in that part of the Interesting event? question. I've never been asked that question before. You're a very astute observer. <laughs> so what's happening is that um, that's basically the Jehovah's Witness version of communion. So they're doing, you know, um, they're, Jesus, before he died, he took the loaf and he drank the wine. Um, we call it the sacrament in Mormonism. Sacrament. Yeah. And so Jehovah's Witnesses observe that once a year, but because they believe that, remember I mentioned the 144,000, they believe that only the 144,000 are going to heaven. Those are the only people who actually partake of that sacrament. So the rank and file who are called the great crowd, we're the ones that will just survive Armageddon and go on to live on the earth in paradise, but the 144,000 will rule with Jesus in heaven. Because so there's a Bible scripture that yeah. mentions that number. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In Revelation, I mean, it's most any theologian, theologian would say that is not a literal, literal number because of much like Revelation is a symbolic book, but Jehovah's Witnesses take that as a, as a literal number. And so those who partook of the bread and wine believe themselves to be of that anointed class that will go to heaven. Um, how you know if you're anointed is that you just know. <laughs> and a problem for the Jehovah's Witnesses in recent years has been that that, that number was constantly going down because there is something in the Jehovah's Witness theology that said that those members of the 144,000 who were alive at the beginning of the last days, they, their generation would not pass away until Armageddon came. But the problem is they say it started in 1914, the last days. Now what are we? So you got to be like 105. 
So what's happened, though, is that when I was younger, the number went down every year because these older people would die that were anointed. But then, for whatever reason, there was this resurgence, and now the number keeps going up. And more and more younger people are partaking and believing that they're the anointed. And so it's also been a sort of a problem for them to explain away because they keep the numbers and they publish it every year. And every year it's going up, which doesn't fit with their theology. So these things are never, these are fascinating and things. If, and if I understand it, and, and we talked about this with Lloyd as well, if, if, if someone, and plenty of ex-Mormons would understand this, if some enterprising ex jehovahs witness wanted to, they could probably find the records to count out, count up all the people that claim to be part of the 144,000. And guess what? It's more than 144,000. Oh, yeah. And so uh, just if you're a religious leader, stay away from dates and numbers. <laughs> we could be consultants. Right? Dates and numbers. <laughs> for cults. Just stick with us. Yeah, we'll, we'll help you out there. <laughs> but it's a, it's a problem. It is. This is a problem. When I think when this is the thing is when you think the world's going to end in a year when you found the religion, you don't foresee all these problems with it. It's when it keeps going 100, 120 years, it's like, now what? And I'm looking at Carla's face, she looks really confused, but I'm guessing what that confusion is, and I'm just going to predict that it's one thing, you know, it, it, in, in Mormonism, it's like the Mormons, you know, take the sacrament, but if a non-Mormon takes it, it's no big deal, right? And then we hear about in Catholicism, like, Catholics take communion, but if, like, you know, the bishop is mad at Joe Biden, Joe Biden doesn't get to take communion, you know, because... Maybe he's pro-choice or whatever, right? But I'm, you know, trying to imagine a, a religious tradition where the rank and file members don't get to take communion, right? Except for a few that are self-appointed, sort of like extra special people, where the majority of the people in the room aren't taking the communion. Yeah. That's kind of mind-blowing. Yeah. And yet that's, that's the but way you it is. You know when you're raised with it or it's just, it's just everything is normal to you. Even the weird things. Was there ever, like in Mormonism, there's sort of this like, I want to be a bishop or I want to be a state president or I want to be a general authority. And of course, women can't relate because that's not an option for you. But how many of you men wanted to be a bishop or a general authority someday in your secret heart of hearts? I sure did. Yeah. So did you secretly want to be one of the 144,000? Did you ever have that kind of hope or? No, no. I wanted to live in a log cabin and make goat cheese, remember? <laughs> <laughs> So you didn't want that. I, I just, I mean, part of what really stuck me to the religion as I got older and, you know, as a normal, reasonably intelligent person, sometimes maybe I had doubts, was that I just really wanted to live forever. I love earth. I love life. I like being alive. And the idea that I could just continue on living in a paradise that looked like Utah would be fantastic. Because <laughs> basically all the publications, when they illustrate the paradise, I got to say, it kind of looks like Utah. <laughs> What do you guys think? Should we try and encourage Amber and Lee to move to Utah? Would, you, would that be, would, she be, would they be welcome here? Lee, if you're watching, think about it. Think about it. All right, let's have our next question. Okay, um, so in what ways or what human needs do you feel like being a member of your church gave you or uh, helped you meet like acceptance, purpose, peace, and how have you been able to fulfill those needs since leaving? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. It is a really good question. So what are the good things, right? <laughs> it's really hard for me to say because from a really young age, when I think back, like the overriding thing that I felt was fear. And of course the fear, like the fear of dying if you left it. And then the fear of abandonment, like of your family and your friends and your community. But of course it was mixed with, really like enmeshed with all this love and the only solution to the fear was to be in the congregation where the love was. So for me to like pick apart and say what need was being met, I think I felt safe. I, I had a family that was pretty dysfunctional. My dad was an alcoholic. That's what led to his death. And um, my parents didn't have a good marriage. And I think for me it was a feeling of safety. And so when I left, I mean, I was older. I was in my 30s, and I think that's what kept me in for a long time was that it was this idea of a place where, you know, the world is chaotic, things are scary, I can just go be here and it will be okay. And it's interesting because my sister, who grew up in the same family, she, after I left, also left for a little while. 
And I was so excited because there was this golden time in our family where it was like, oh, wow, we're free from the religion. And we are like, she was veering towards Christmas. It was so exciting. Like, you know, she had never celebrated it. And then um, something happened. Um, her child was born and, and was disabled. And she just went right back to it after that. And I think that there was something about the control and the safety that just she couldn't, she felt that she had to live that way. And ironically, when she was out, she had told me, you know, I realize when I'm not in the religion, I'm happier than when I'm in it, but she still went back to it. So ultimately, when you speak to like, I could see how like maybe this idea of acceptance or community, but I didn't realize until I left that I never really felt like I fit in there. I didn't really like going to the meetings. I, I felt like friendships felt like I like, I had some good friends, but it felt weird to like, be with people that you didn't feel always kindred with, but have to spend all your time together. And so when I left, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm such a better worldly person, as we call them, than a witness in a way, because I'm just really curious. I am interested in things. I like learning. And so in the end, I feel like my needs are just, they were all suppressed. Like a lot of the parts of me were suppressed when I was in it, and I didn't even know. But then leaving opened up all these things that were needs that I had that I didn't even know, if that makes sense. So there's not a lot, is there much that you miss? Or Do you know what I miss is the certainty, just the comfort of knowing, not having confusion about life and the world and climate change, like all of that stuff is still kind of scary to me, but it's manageable. Um, but ultimately, I also think now, many years out, I'd miss that less because there's something, I'm a little bit in more of a place where I, I can sit in the mystery of it and find it really beautiful. And I think um, after leaving, putting this like humanity in perspective with like the length of time the universe has existed, all of these things create this great sense of wonder in me that sort of dampens down all the fear I used to have in this way. And or the need for certainty. And it's just, to me, a much more mature way of living, and which always feels better and more settling than this kind of black and white, very immature way of looking at things. But certainty sure feels good. I know, it does. It, right? yeah. it does. And it's also, looking back, it's so arrogant. Like, I think back of how that certainty <clears throat> makes you so arrogant, and it's, it's really embarrassing to me now to think how sure I was because I mean, what a joke <laughs> it's not and it's tempting to your growth it is yeah. to think you're better than everyone and know everything and basically. you there's so much you stop yourself from learning yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's be I see a lot of heads <laughs> <laughs> so I went on a mission as well and I think that there's Missouri where Jesus is going to come <laughs> 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 uh, um, but I really there's nothing I was so indoctrinated but then there's nothing like teaching people and also being indoctrinated and indoctrinating somebody yeah. else so getting out of that at the end of your book you kind of talk about how you would like go out with your friends and you would like check and be like are you sure Armageddon isn't happening and they'd be like no it's okay Yeah. so like are there still uh, like what was the hardest thing for you to kind of unindoctrinate yourself out of and then are there things that still happen that you kind of have to like catch yourself and you're like oh wow I don't think that way anymore yeah I mentioned the fear because I think fear is something that gets like formed in your neural pathway and so even when you deprogram it can just come back really quickly and for a long time um, you know just like lightning storm I was like, oh it's Armageddon I was wrong and even like when people started to talk a lot more about climate change five years ago it was so apocalyptic that, for one thing, I couldn't, like I still to this day can't really read articles about it because I just find it so traumatic. But over time, it stopped being linked in the same way with this fear that, like, what if they were right? But I will say for the first five years at least, six years maybe, I would still have moments when there was something, like, cataclysmic feeling mm -hmm. and think, what if, they, what if they were right? But, you know, as someone told me... <laughs> They were like, one of my worldly friends was like, dude, if, if like paradise is a world full of Jehovah's Witnesses, like this is, you don't want to be there. 
And then I'll never forget that there was this one magazine or video that the Jehovah's Witnesses put out a few years ago. And they sh it was this vision of what paradise would look like. And all of the people were wearing these sacks, like their clothing. And someone said online, see, that's what happens when you kill all the gays. <laughs> <laughs> you want to live in that world? No. <laughs> yeah, without without queer eye, we're all screwed, right? Yeah, yeah we need that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, really quick, uh, one of the listeners, Thomas, writes: at first, not feeling that certainty really just put me into a sense of chaos. But on this side of things now, it's okay to be uncertain. Who really is certain? like factually and absolutely certain no one is. So thank you, Thomas, for your, yeah. for your comment out in Facebook land. Chad wants to know what, what was your view of the Mormons back then, and I think you've already shared that. So yeah. Chad, go back and listen to the beginning of the interview. She talks all about it. And I also would like to speak a bit more to what the, I can't remember his name, said about the Thomas. certainty, yeah. Thomas, is that I think it's really important for, you know, it's, it's easy to be impatient when you leave because so much of your life you feel was wasted on something not true. But I think it's really a big part of this is that you have to be patient with yourself and you don't have to figure it all out overnight. Um, it took me a long time to, you know, sort through it all in my head. And one thing that just helped was being patient, reading, you know, things on different topics, exposing myself to different ways of thinking. And slowly, all the puzzle pieces will fit in in a way that you can live with it. So I think the most important thing is to, I remember feeling like freaking out at the beginning, that feeling he mentions of chaos. Um, but this is something that can only be resolved by time. You can't really rush through to some other side where you're going to just be okay with it. And I think you just have to kind of be like, breathe. Okay, everything feels chaotic right now. It's not always going to be this way. Things change. And slowly, that does change. All right. Um, uh, we have another question from listeners. Uh, this question was asked earlier. Are the witnesses a con as controlling about food and drink as the Mormons? So thanks to our, our listener on Facebook who asked that question. Food and drink. I don't know all of the Mormon rules, but so I do Mormon know. So Mormon rules are no coffee, no tea, no tobacco. Oh, without coffee. No drugs. <laughs> No alcohol. I would have been apostate like day one if that was the rule. <laughs> <laughs> but witnesses are pretty strict. Um, the only thing was we were always like, thank God, Jesus, literally, thank God that Jesus drank in the Bible because that, I always wondered why so Mormons okay. couldn't drink because Jesus did, right? Yeah. Why? Are you asking why Mormonism doesn't make sense? <laughs> is, that, is that your question? It yeah. doesn't make sense to you, Amber? <laughs> well, I apologize for that. Maybe... <laughs> Um, but yeah, <laughs> drugs, no, big no, definitely no drugs, um, definitely no, uh, no excessive alcohol. Um, but of course, you know, when you allow a little, it was always a constant trouble with teenagers getting in trouble for drinking too much. But I don't know why this feels related. It's not really related, but I'll never, don't, don't forget that like Prince became a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, Prince. <laughs> and when I remember the day that happened, I was like, oh my. Because, you know, I did listen to Prince. Um, and I was like, we can invite Prince to our, to our party. Not that he wouldn't come, but it was like, <laughs> suddenly Prince was like party like it's eighteen Party like it's 1899. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, except for us, it would be like party like it's 1975. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there, it, it was restricted. Like, in movie, you know, we definitely there was a real, like, emphasis on being clean. As far as food, I think it was only blood. Anything that hadn't been bled, um, things had to be kosher, basically. Um, coffee, no. I mean, how do you think we preached all those hours? Like, it was only the coffee that got us through. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to give it to you, Mormons. Yeah. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> On behalf of Mormons, I accept <laughs> your compliment. <laughs> Um, that's great. Uh, okay, there's a couple more questions, but let's go ahead and take one from our audience. So thanks again for being here. I think if we're cousins by religious tradition, we're siblings by lived experience. And, and I think that extends to sort of the faith transition, which is why your message resonates so deeply with, with so many. Um, and so I would ask, um, you, you mentioned patience, but what things have been important in your healing and sort of processing that kind of transition, the grief that's associated, and, and then rebuilding afterward. 
That's an interesting question because I feel like so much of this stuff is personality based and it's different for everyone. But for me, what actually ultimately got me out of the religion was reasoning. Someone had to show me the way to reason. I couldn't reason myself out of it. But once I did, it was this sort of way of using your mind to come to conclusions that were irrefutable, that got me to see that my religion was false, that it didn't make sense. And so after leaving, um, you know, I tried going to a couple churches in New York. It was really hard. I remember the first time I went to a church, it was kind of like, it was like a really like warm and fuzzy church and it was a church for artists. So people would go and just play music and sort of share stories. So it was like a low, low key, like transition for someone like me. Um, and on the way to that church, when I decided to check it out, this woman was on the subway reading at a Watchtower magazine right across from me. And I hadn't been out of the religion that long. And I was like, oh my goodness, like we don't even believe in signs as Jehovah's Witnesses, but suddenly I'm believing in signs when I see this person reading the Watchtower. Like, um, but the church didn't feel, I, I just couldn't bring myself to join another religion or to even really believe anymore. It was really something that for me didn't come naturally after having feel, felt so deceived in a way. So I um, enrolled in college because, as I said, I never got a degree. And for me, just getting an education, it's been, I've been doing it for seven years now, going on eight, because I've had to work in between and I wrote a book and had kids. Um, but just every single class that I've taken has almost felt like a religious experience to me, just because of the connections that I started to make between different things in the world. And then over the years, it's changed. I was sort of interested in some things for a while. And then now I've really gotten hardcore into taking religion classes, which in the end is what my degree is going to be in, which is so ironic because I'm not religious. But that's for me has been really healing just to learn that, for example, you know, you study historical philosophers. Um, right now we're doing like the existentialists in my religion class. And I read about these people that wrote books, you know, hundreds of years ago or whatever. And they're struggling with the same questions that ultimately, like, I have struggled with since leaving my religion. And there's something about seeing that other people in this entirely different culture, in a different era, they, they have these same questions that has been somehow really uplifting to me and encouraging in this way, where I realize, you know what, there's these really smart people who, the smarter they seem to get, the more they say, no one has any idea. So I've found that really helped me. Great. Thank you. Uh, a listener, a viewer on Facebook named Sarah writes, what was that moment? Uh, did you personally go back and forth with it in your mind? Oh, sorry. I think she means that moment when you knew the church wasn't, you know, what you thought it was. Mm. So what, talk a, a little bit about kind of your realization that the church might not be what it, what it claimed to be and how you arrived at that, what that process was like. Yeah, it, a lot of people I think that aren't in religions like this think you just, it's like a movie where you just wake up one day and I don't know if it's how it was for any of you, but where it's just like, oh, it's like I just like, like had this epiphany. Show. Yeah, and I just woke up one you day. see the light fall out. So know. I, yeah, I went back and forth a lot. I mean, there was a few moments like along the way that um, kind of were little beacons of light. And uh, one of them was, I remember I was having a lot of doubts and I, I had for various reasons just stopped going to the meetings for a while. Um, my marriage was ending. It was awkward. People knew that I was having doubts, and that is really awkward because then you're an apostate, which is scary. Um, and so I was in Shanghai by myself, and I spent quite a bit of time alone, obviously, because I didn't have a community anymore. And so after a while, I was like, well, maybe it's like better to just go back because it's partly right is better than not nothing. And a lot of people that I know that were witnesses who were smart people would use that line of reasoning to stay in where they'd be like, well, it's still better than anything else like out there. So it's closest to true. But I remember I went, so I went back to the meeting that they have in like secret locations in Shanghai so that they don't get found by the authorities. And I mean, that was a humili humiliating experience as it is, but you know, you're kind of used to that when you're in a religion like that. And so I sat there and just listening to what they were saying, it was, it felt like I was hearing things I had never heard before. And 
um, that was a real moment for me of awakening because I realized that no matter how much I want it to be true, I can't participate in this anymore. I don't think it's right. There's things that feel wrong in here. So that was a kind of a moment along the way. But the true, the true moment where I really knew that I would never go back to it was someone um, sent me this book that was written by one of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses back in the 80s who had turned apostate. What's the name of the book? Uh, Crisis of Conscience. And he, this book was kind of folklore. I had heard about it as a witness, but we were always warned, never read any of this stuff by people who have left. It's all from Satan. And that guy why, was why prideful. Why are you smiling and laughing out there? <laughs> and they we always, have a book called No Man Knows My History that is a very similar book. So this man was really quite intelligent and very, he just documented in a very non-emotionally charged way. It was nothing like what they had told me it would be. It was, I was told it was, this guy was prideful and just wanted, he was like Satan and wanted glory. That's why he wrote this book. So someone sent it to me. At the time, it wasn't that easy to find because, you know, the internet now kind of has a lot more of these kind of materials out there. But someone that knew me sent it to me. And I remember I, I was afraid of it. Like, even holding it, I was terrified. It felt like this object that could, like, reach out and strangle. You know, you've been taught to fear it so much. But I went, so I went to a bar in Shanghai. And Shanghai is a wonderful place and it has this, like, really interesting mix of cultures. But you can find, like, really nice French wine bars. But... Um, it's also really cheap. Like you can get two for one wines as long as you arrive before 7 p.m. So I got there at like 6.58 and like ordered two wines at once so I could get one free. You know, as a missionary, I had no money. Um, and so I, I, I've had the wine there. And so I start, I needed the wine to like be able to open the book. And so I started reading the book and I think I was probably 14 pages in. And just because of what he was saying, it was so factual. It was so honest. And it was basically, it, it showed me that even though everything in my religion added up, the foundation was flawed, and therefore it didn't matter that it all added up. And I remember really clearly this feeling I had, and the feeling was relief. I remember thinking, I don't have to do this anymore. Like, I was just so happy. And I knew it was terrifying, because what am I going to do with my life? I'm in China. I'm sort of separated from my... Ha I, I don't really have a, anything to fall back on. But it didn't matter. I was like, I can't, I'm not going to do it anymore. It's not true. Yeah, well, I'm glad I'm happy for you. <laughs> um, for me, one of the really interesting parts in, the, in this wonderful book, Leaving the Witness by Amber Scora, is the dialogue you had with that the gentleman from the United States. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, were, I had a podcast back when podcasting started. We were back cousins at early podcasting. 2005, 2006, right yeah. there. The Before moment. the world was podcasting, we were podcasting. Um, but my podcast was uh, based in Shanghai, and it was about life as a foreigner in China, which no one at the time knew. I was a Jehovah's Witness at my work, and why I knew so much about Chinese culture was because I was a secret missionary, but no one knew that. Um, but anyways, part of my job was to interact with the online community and respond to emails and this type of stuff. And so I always and you know corresponded with our listeners but there was just this one correspondence that turned into almost like a pen pal online and it was very innocent I didn't even know what the person looked like or anything um, but slowly we just started talking all the time and then g-chatting and still had never met or anything but the topics turned to religion somehow because we talked every day at some, uh, after a few months we started to talk every day and he was just a guy that was like a free thinker. And the second I told him that I was a Jehovah's Witness, he, was, he said, I knew it. I knew you were under the control of something. And I was furious. But there was something, you know, we had already talked on t every topic under the sun. And I'm not, I am definitely the type of person that doesn't mind having a good debate. And I always felt, as a witness, so confident in my beliefs that I was like, eh, I'll just prove him wrong famous last words, um, the conversation went on and on and on. And then eventually he was the one that started researching things that I wouldn't have dared look up myself. And he became this conduit to like a world that I would never, ever have, I would never have gone down that path if I hadn't have gotten that close and intimate with him, even for meeting. But it's funny because years later after I left, I was reading tons of books about mind control and one of the main ways that people get out of these kinds of high control religions <clears throat> is by having 
a relationship with someone on the outside because anyone else could have told me those things and I would have just blocked them out. But because we already sort of had this connection, even online, um, I started to listen. And it, ultimately that reasoning that he used started to wake me up. And so in the book, there's all these excerpts. Thank goodness that um, Gmail saves all of your chats. I'm like, how did you remember all this? I mean, there was so many, but yeah. um, no, I didn't have to remember, thankfully. Because also, I don't think I could have recreated his voice because he had a very distinct kind of... He was very direct. direct very antagonizing. Direct, antagonizing. Yeah. But I'm a very direct person too, so I think it kind of was okay for me in this way. Because he, he was direct, but he was honest, but he was also compassionate. Like, he held sort of empathy for my position and never really gave up on the fact that he was sure that I would eventually see it. There needs to be some Sleepless in Seattle remake <laughs> where it's like your story laid on top of, of, yeah. uh, of that one. But I, I'm not going to give the spoiler away, but you guys ended up meeting face-to-face. -face. Yes. And, and so I'm not going to tell you what happens, but they meet face-to-face. -face. What happens? <laughs> Did they hang out? Did they get in a fight? Did they <laughs> fall in mad love? Who knows? You, you have to read the book to find out. So, so here it is, Leaving the Witness. Uh, buy the book uh, on Amazon or here at our book shelf. And uh, you, can, you can find out what happened with that relationship. Okay, next question. Um, as I read the book, it was interesting to see the parallels between the two religious traditions and... We've already talked a little bit about shunning. Um, seems more overtly with the Jehovah's Witnesses versus Mormonism's a little more passive aggressive. Mm. Um, I'm curious your relationship with your family now, if it's kind of all or nothing, or if you've had any kind of relationship. Uh, that's one of the things with changing faith traditions in Mormonism is your relationship with your family members who are still believing. Yeah. So I'm curious how that works with you. Yeah, I, I was always closest to my dad, but he passed away already. My mom and I were not super close. Um, my sister and I were close, but so my mom doesn't speak to me now. My sister totally shuns me as well. But my one lucky break was that my, I have a younger brother and he never got baptized. So, you know, in these religions, I don't know, it's, there's always these loopholes. So because my brother sort of flew under the radar, didn't get pressured into being baptized. Usually we get baptized anywhere from like pre-teen to, you know, late teens. He kind of just slid on out because he was a few years younger than my sister and I. And so he never became a witness. So I still have him, which I'm really grateful for. And um, that means a lot because when you at least have one thread, I think that it's something that connects you. But there's a lot of byproducts of shunning that you don't, people don't realize. Like, for example, I have a daughter now and... I don't have any of my baby pictures or childhood pictures because like they're locked in my mom's storage. And so I can't even see if she looked like, like I can kind of remember what I maybe looked like in those pictures. There's like a lot of things that are really just so cut off. And my, you know, my daughter, her doesn't have a grandma on my side. She has cousins, my sister's children that she's never met. My sister's never met my daughter. Um, that part's really hard because, you know, you, it's one thing when it's you, but then you're like, my child will not have this, she won't know what it is to be a Scora. Like, she won't have this identi like sort of I identifier as, you know, this other side of her family. She has no frame of reference for it. So I find that really hard. Um, it's, it's difficult. And, but yeah, I don't have a huge family. So I do have some, like, extended family. I have one cousin who, when I left, and this is always a really exciting thing to me. I don't know if, this, if any of you have had this experience, but sometimes when you're the first one to leave... It seems like no one will ever else, like you can't imagine anyone else leaving, but suddenly someone else will just pop out of the woodwork. And when I left, my cousin... I see lots of heads nodding yeah. in the audience, yeah. And I always think that that's something that's really hopeful, because even to this day, you don't know who might leave. It might be your very best friend that might leave one day, and you don't know what the thing will be. And one of my cousins um, had been very devout, like pioneered and, you know, Anyways, she wrote me after I left and was like really distressed and wanted to know why I left. And I thought, it's really funny because the people who actually really want to know, I've noticed, there's something there. Even though they're arguing with you why you need to stay, most people are too afraid to ask what it is. And I've known a couple people who were like that. And she left. She ended up coming out as gay. And she was gay her whole life. And you know, I'm just so happy for her. She's in a wonderful relationship now. 
Um, so I have her, but you know, I moved away my own fault to the East Coast and they all live still in BC. So I don't, I get to see them like once a year. Um, but also as far as friends, even in my book, there's like a few characters in the book that, you know, I would never have met, but after the book came out, they heard about it and told me that they actually also not left, but don't believe anymore. And a lot of people stay in because they don't want to lose their families, but you know, you just never, you just never know. Um, and that's something that is kind of hopeful because it does feel really final when people cut you off, but it's actually, it's not final because you're there waiting the second that they come back. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> we have, uh, we're getting a few other great questions from our listening audience uh, or viewing audience on Facebook. Remington wants to know, are the witnesses shrinking and is it known or covered up? That's a great question. Well, they do document things like every year they publish their numbers. And I think the most recent one I saw, it's still growing at maybe 1% worldwide. It used to be when I was a witness, it was sort of 2%. So it's definitely going down. Um, but uh, that number doesn't really, I don't think, give the whole picture because a lot of children are born into it and get baptized. And so they're counting that as growth. And so if you offset all the people that were leaving with the Mount Born, I think there's a ton of people leaving. And even from the time I left until now, since writing my book, so many ex Jehovah's Witnesses have contacted me. And I can't, I mean, it's not a scientific study, but it seems like an avalanche of people, even in the last year or two, are leaving. And a lot of why people are waking up is because of podcasts like yours and Lloyd's, people that are doing online activism. Now it's just, you know, a Google search away to find information. And I always say this, that if the, when I had got this fellowship that first time with my uh, boyfriend, if we could have looked on the internet, we, we would have gotten out. So it's kind of a fantastic time that we are living in for people seeking information because back then, how would I have found out any information about Joe's and Isis? But now it's so easy to find. And so good work on your part. <laughs> well, <laughs> and others you like you. Applause, were you about to applaud? <laughs> <laughs> like, applause. applause, please. <laughs> um, so uh, do, you, do you, like, within Mormonism, there's this real stigma about, like, trying to get people to leave. And even ex-Mormons will always say, I don't, I don't, stay or go, it's okay, I just want to support whatever decision you make. And do you, you know, was part of a motivation in writing this book to get people out or not? Or how do you think of that? Do you think of it as a victory when someone leaves? You know, how do, what Definitely. are your motives? Definitely. Like, I, I kind of am just... I am respectful of people's decision. I'm not like a proselytizer f for leaving, but I'm not afraid to be a shit disturber. Like I'll be honest and put my story out there because I, if I ha was leaving and knew that there was a life possible on the other side, th that would have helped me to know. So I think of it as something that is out there that people can find when they need it. Um, and definitely I don't hesitate from saying what I think about it. I don't, Maybe, I mean, I don't feel, I feel like it benefited me that somebody crossed lines that I wasn't comfortable with in my reasoning. So I will, when I have hecklers who write me on Facebook, I always engage with them when I can. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel happy when people leave because I know it hasn't been easy for me to leave. I've gone through a lot and it's you know, starting a new life at age 33 with no education and job prospects in a new city is not easy. And but, very little family support, Yeah, very right? little, like literally almost no support. Um, it's, it was hell at times, honestly, but I've never met one single ex Jehovah's Witness or ex-Mormon who has left and said that they regretted it. Everyone is so much more happy <laughs> when they're out of it. And to me, it's, it speaks to this, Thing that is in us as human beings that we need to be free when someone is controlling us we even though I thought I was happy I realized there was all kinds of things I had to suppress and control within myself in order to feel that sense that I was okay so yeah of course I think everyone's better off outside that religion but I also respect people make their own decisions and they have their reasons for staying and it's not you know it's it's a hard thing to do to leave it's a little bit delayed, uh, but, well, I was going to say one thing, that I do have sort of this spectrum of cult severity, and I, 
I, you know, we've made the joke, people have made the observation before that, that, that Mormons are super grateful for Scientologists because it makes them look less culty and weird, yeah. right? We all pick on the Scientologists. <laughs> Sorry, but, guys. And I don't know if you'll take umbrage at this, but I, if I'm sort of trying to put, put different faiths on a, on a con cult continuum, I actually put Jehovah's Witnesses somewhere between Mormonism and Scientology because of the shunning and the blood yeah. transfusion stuff. Yeah. And it, tell me if you take umbrage with that or if you're okay with that or... No, one, a, a couple you of You can the, tell me I'm more culty than you if you want. That's okay. <laughs> I just don't know you well enough yet, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, there was two big problems I had with the witnesses when I did have doubts. And it, you know, they were the big moral issues. Later, everything else fell apart too. But at the beginning, I still believed everything else. But I could not reconcile once I started to reason through it that um, this no blood, no blood transfusion thing where, you know, the magazines of the witnesses glorify young children who died because they refused to take a blood transfusion. And when I started to do my own research and thinking, I realized, you know, they had picked out this scripture in the Old Testament, and then there's another one in Acts that said, you know, abstain from blood, and it was, you know, the foremost command. But then there was this other scripture where Jesus said that it was better to save a life on the Sabbath and break the law because a life superseded that law. So when I realized that, I was like, wait a minute, so like tens of thousands of people have died for no reason for this arbitrary human mistake. And that's just like the worst form of blood guilt. And you know what? That's not that different from drinking Kool-Aid to me because if you're mandating people die when it comes to it over an erroneous belief and you're controlling people to do this, it's just as wrong. So I agree with you, definitely. And then the shunning too. I mean, it's led to a lot of suicide for one thing, but... I never believe that any religion should come between a person and their family. Like, it's just, it is immoral and it's wrong that a child would shun their own parent. I know parents don't even know their grandchildren. Um, that's, that's a cult. Yeah. Um, do you, so Mormonism, and just in the past couple of years, there, it seems like the church is finally catching on and they're starting to make changes in response to the past 14 years on the internet. Oh, wow. Do, do you get a sense that your work, the other you know YouTubers, the other people who have left, all the Google and social media stuff, do you get the sense that your that Jehovah's Witnesses are transforming internally as well to response? No, they're, not they're, at all. They're double down. What, what do you mean? Well, if you take for example, that's you know a problem in many churches, which is child sexual abuse. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a particularly acute case of. Um, this flourishing in their congregations because they, again, pulled out a strange scripture from the Old Testament that said to accuse a brother, you must have two witnesses, and child sexual abuse never has two witnesses to the crime. Interesting. You How guys that use that too? Well, the, yeah. Similar. So anyway, um, so there was a whole Australian royal no, I'm commission. I'm just saying who abuses a child with another person yeah. in the room, right? It's a, so what would happen it's an awful is, rule, right? yeah, so people, like children would come forward, the parents would go to the elders, there's a molester in the congregation, you know, an elder, who knows, someone in a position of authority that can take a kid out in service with him alone um, and would say, like my child was said she was molested. And so the, the, the blanket response nearly all of the time was, well, if we don't have another witness, we can't do anything about it. But they would also discourage people from going to the police because we've been taught never take your brother to court because it would make the witnesses look bad. It's reproach on Jehovah's name. And so that just creates this perfect storm that you're just harboring child abusers. So a lot of this stuff, there's been activists for many years who were extra witnesses who have, you know. Carla has a confused look on her face again. <laughs> exposing this kind of stuff. Um, and you know, when the witnesses have been presented with, you know, in the media, all, you know what they say? They say it's all apostate lies. Like, it's people like me making up lies. There's been child abuse cases have been judged in court, and the Watchtower has been found liable, millions of dollars in settlements. And they still, like, rank and file members will believe the authority, the leadership, and believe that it's just apostate lies. So they... All they do is just like lash out at the accuser. And if anything, the group has become more extreme over the years when it comes to shunning because they didn't used to harp on parents and children being shunned in the same way. Like there was sort of like a gray area there, but now they're very explicit that this applies across the board. And of course, they're getting more desperate because more and more people are waking up and leaving and seeing that it's culty. And so they have to redouble their efforts to keep control over people. 
and it works in some cases. Yeah, and that's been, I, it, it's actually just due to the work of, of a name all of you here will know, which is Sam Young, a, a former Mormon bishop who started a movement to sort of protect Mormon children where we've discovered bishops and top leaders and members of our congregations not only, you know, were, were caught and accused of sexually abusing children, but in many cases they were kept in their positions or even promoted um, and and always in our church, this is where a dark area where we're cousins, in the sense that uh, it's been longstanding tradition to discourage members from going to the police. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's weird. It's like parallel universes that have a really dark side that's almost identical. Yeah, and it's hard to think about what it is because it's it's hard for me now being out as long as I am to separate the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses from their like fragile male egos or something. I don't know. Like, it's just weird how this power corrupts in a way their sense of even compassion. Like you didn't want, you don't want to protect the children first and foremost, but ultimately I think they're afraid of changing anything because it means admitting they're wrong, which I think when you've been in this position of power with people basically, you know, worshiping you. F- yeah. Like figuratively bowing down to you, even though they pretend that people don't worship them but they hang on every word they say, I think you get a skewed sense of what is right and wrong and a skewed sense of morality. And that's a big problem, I think, in religious organizations that are led by people that have unchecked power. And particularly, it's always men. It is. And it's, and not, not to like, we, we've got our own stuff, but like to take a scripture like 144,000, some number, and have this really severe teaching that, that has, like we said, a really significant ripple effect on the entire culture and the, you know, the way that you guys do communion and all that. And yet there's a scripture where Jesus says, you know, if anyone offends one of these children, better it be that a millstone is hung around yeah. their neck and they be dropped in the... That's kind of like, oh, well, that's not as important, right? Like, I always think it's really sad the way that these religions are so often formed with good intentions. And like, if you look back at the original <laughs> formation of Jehovah's Witnesses, I remember reading that Charles Taze Russell didn't even believe that there should be a name to the group. He just called it Bible student. He didn't think there should be any kind of hierarchy. He didn't think, he thought that people should just get together and study and encourage each other. And somehow it always morphs into this legalistic, Pharisee-like culture that over, you know, tens and tens and tens of years becomes about controlling people rather than when the whole beginning of it was freedom in Christ and this type of philosophy, you know? Yeah, Christian religions tend to evolve as they mature into a mockery of Christ's teachings. Yeah, and then to not be able to see it is the strangest thing to me. Yeah, yeah, it's just the power of, of, um, of a confirmation bias. Yeah. You, you see what reinforces what you want to see Yeah, and you ignore anything that goes against kind of what you yeah. want to think and feel. Yeah. All right, another question from the audience, and we've got a couple more, and then we'll close for, for tonight. Okay, so going back to the Scientologists again, I've heard that they have like their own mafia that will go after people who speak out. Have you been, or has your former church tried to silence you, since, especially since you have a book and you speak out against them? Yeah, it's weird. It's been silent on that front. Um, Especially from people who I like, I was a little fearful, like not fearful, but you know, I do. I still have a like a, a connection to people I loved, and I've imagined like maybe someone's just gonna like rip into me. But I forgot how much they teach people to fear apostates and to not even get near them because they think that you're gonna, you know, sort of affect them or manipulate them. Uh, but as far as the leadership or anything like that, nothing. I sometimes take great joy in imagining the wall like at the headquarters and like there's like a hit list and I'm probably like moving up every day <laughs> and I'm probably like one of the only women on that list and I always think ah oh, you guys always underestimated us women didn't you <laughs> but no it feels it feels like yes, interesting like Jehovah's Witnesses have never been really particularly litigious um they sort of always took the tack of sort of trying to fly under the radar they weren't sort of aggressive although they have been more aggressive in recent years in like trying to find out the identities of people on reddit they've lost um and suing people but when because my book was published through a publisher they have a legal department that reads the whole book and 
make sure that there's nothing in there that they can sue you for. And, you know, I changed a couple details to do with people, but she said that everything that I said is my right to say. So, so far, so good. <laughs> What's it like, and this is just kind of activist to activist a little bit, What's it like for your own emotional well-being or energy to know that you're kind of a lone voice trying to speak out against an organization that's not only so powerful, but that means so much to so many people? And, it, and in some sense, it's an act of courage, but it's also an act of ad ad adversity or adversarialness. I don't know quite the right word, opposition. But... I've experienced, a, you know, sometimes you can get caught up in negative energy, right? Yeah. You're fighting against something. You're fighting. You're, you're kind of, you've taken up the sword. You've taken up the shield. You're, you're David against Goliath. Yeah. That has some sort of certainly an emotional or psychological impact on you, on your, on your life, on your marriage, on your relationships, on how you go about the world. I don't mean to be projecting that, but it's sort of one person attempting to make a difference to another, what's that like for you? How many years have you been excommunicated? Uh, well, I've been doing Curious. this work for 14 years. 14 years. I was excommunicated four years ago. Four years ago, yeah. Yeah, it's strange for me. I don't, it doesn't really... I think because I had such a severe break with it, and most of the turmoil and difficulty I felt was in those first few years because it was such a shocking transition. It was like my life before made no sense with my life after. And it was really hard to make sense of that myself, of my own personal identity or history or something. But I think because I was so forced to build this new life and I moved to New York City where I didn't know anybody, which was really stupid, but all worked out in the end, I guess. <laughs> um, something happened to me where the it's been 11 years or so now, the Joe's Witness organization, the more years that go by, just it sort of shrinks in my mind. And I think my world has just expanded. I've learned so many things um, that the ability for it to have any kind of power over me is nearly basically gone. And so when I speak out openly about this stuff, I think it's just me giving a testimony of one life. And I've been you know, not surprised, but, you know, it's been really wonderful to discover that that is the story of a lot of us out here. And if anything now, that's become really healing for me and really encouraging in this way where, you know, it's just wonderful to have this connection to the past. And even if it's not my own former friends who I can be friends with now because they shun me, suddenly there's this whole community of people who feel like family when you meet them right away. So if anything, this book for me has felt overwhelmingly positive because it gave me that, but it also gave me this ability to reach into the past and stitch it together with my present, which was something for a long time that felt like this chasm I couldn't really make sense of. But writing a book helps you sort of parse these things in a way that gives you back the narrative of your life, which I think is really important because our narrative is lost when we leave this faith of our birth, you know, and it's been really wonderful to get that back. So we brought, we brought you here, Amber, to keynote uh, at Thrive. There's a lot of things you could be doing with your time. You really didn't know me much from Adam when I, when I proposed it. What, what was it about Thrive or about, you know, speaking that, that, you know, what, what made you want to come and, uh, and do this? There was no like, at least, if, you know, there's no monetary like, hey, we'll pay you. It was just like, hey, do you want to come speak at this thing? And you're like, sure, you know, I'll do it. Why do you want to come talk to us? I think when, when you first contacted me and I was on your podcast, um, I was really nice. Like, I didn't know very much about Mormons at all. And after that conversation, it, I, my mind was kind of blown. And then I read people's comments, what they had been saying, like, after the fact. I went back and read and it was fascinating. I mean, I'm a really curious person, and it was just fascinating to me to discover there was all these people who had had a similar lived experience, but under a completely different belief system. And that was really fascinating to me. And also, I just, I liked your, I liked your attitude. 
thought you had a nice positive attitude. And I think that the tone of the conference reflects, it really mirrors exactly where the way that I look at life after religion and that sure you need to sort of pr like process where you came from and you'll go through a lot of emotions, like you'll be angry. And sometimes I still get angry at like lost opportunities or things are messed up that I can't solve because I've you know, lost time or whatever. Um, but ultimately, I don't want the past to consume my present. And I think that, you know, all when you look at the roster of speakers at Thrive, I can't wait to hear what everyone has to say because there's really knowledgeable, interesting people who are speaking to the things that are a really unique need that all of us have when we leave this religion. And, and it's great to kind of to be a part of it. And especially so when it's not even your own religion, then it's also fascinating at the same time. And it's wonderful to meet all of you as well. Yeah. Well, we're super grateful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we are super excited to hear what you have to share with us tomorrow. For those of you in, in uh, Facebook land, uh, you can still register for Thrive at thrivebeyondmormonism.com. We still have some seats left, but we've got 1,600 people plus 1,650 already registered. We'll certainly exceed 1,700. It's the largest gathering of, of post progressive and post-Mormons in the history of mankind. And that's kind of exciting. Um, so, uh, so come tomorrow if you guys are within a, you know, half a day's drive of Salt Lake City. Hope you'll come. It, for those who can't come tomorrow, and we'll just sort of end on this uh, before I give a final plug for this amazing <laughs> book, uh, Leaving the Witness. What, for those who can't come tomorrow, what final advice would you give somebody who's starting a question, who's in the question, who's fearing, uh, you know, the thought of leaving or terrified about their life falling apart and uh, fading away if they, if they make a change? Look into the camera and, and what would you like to say to those people who are in that state of fear and, and petrified angst? Just get out as soon as you can. <laughs> Just don't even waste one more day. <laughs> but also, it's going to be okay. I mean, we're living proof uh, that you can find a life out here. And it's not necessarily easy, but there's a lot of people who have gone through this. And it, it feels like a very alienating experience when you're going through it. But you can find other people who to talk to, and that will help. So do you feel like you're happier now? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, life is real. Life is not easy, but my life feels way more authentic now. And I'm so grateful that I did not live my life for a myth because you live your life differently when you don't believe this is the real life. And that is such a shame to think of all the things that even now, just after a decade or so, that I've gotten to experience um, because I left. And I'm just so full of gratitude that I didn't miss all of that. Beautiful. Well, the book is Leaving the Witness, um, Exiting a Religion and Finding a Life by Amber Scora. Uh, we're really grateful to, is it Sam Weller Books? Is that right? For being here tonight to provide some books. All of you, if, if any of you, uh, you know, I love it when we bring authors here we, uh, we leave with the, with the boxes empty, no pressure, but you know, if you want to support Amber, you can. We'll also have books tomorrow that Amber's willing to sign at Thrive. So please come and please buy the book. Please buy, buy a few for your friends. Uh, let's get this book out because it's a lovely, beautiful book. I read the whole thing, loved every minute of it. I actually listened to it on Audible and Amber actually uh, narrates her own book and that was really lovely to have you kind of expressing it in your own voice. So Audible is also an option, uh, Amazon. Um, and uh, just a couple people we want to thank, uh, Tyler Alden for being willing to do the audiovisual tonight. Again, we want to thank Community of Christ for hosting us tonight. We want to thank all the Mormon Stories donors uh, and the Thrive uh, underwriters who made all this possible. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all for coming tonight and for you, uh, for all of you who made it on Saturday night and for all you who joined us on Facebook. But most of all, can we end by giving Amber Scora uh, a standing ovation for <laughs> what she's given standing. to our community. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>